Jackson State is the first HBCU to ever have their spring game televised. And Gerald Huggins joins as we get to number two. Yes, number two on our top 10 draft eligible HBCU player list. Oh, yeah, it's locked on HBCU. Play my music. <laughs> on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, family? Welcome back to another episode of the Locked On HBCU podcast, your number one Daily one-stop shop for everything HBCU Athletics, Monday through Friday, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And I, of course, am Darian Gray, a.k.a. the Mouth of the South, Texas Southern alum and former TSU Herald Sports editor. Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online, who has you covered all season with more odds, props, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. And Jackson State is having their spring game televised. This is a move that is major. It is historic. It is the first HBCU to ever have this happen nationally. Mind you, we're talking on a national scale. So I have a couple of ways that you could take this information in. I'll tell you about my way and why I personally choose to take it in that way. So I look at Jackson State in Anytime that something happens for the first time, history is made. It's a big moment. It's something that should be discussed. And this isn't news that just broke, but Jackson State spring game is on Saturday. So with the game being Saturday, I thought it was a perfect time. I thought about this, I think about a month ago. Maybe it was either a little over or a little under a month ago that this news broke. And I thought, you know, we're going to wait till the spring game, the week of that spring game, to where we can talk about it. And now the, the week is here. And spring game is. Saturday for Alabama State and for um, Jackson State. So it should have a good time. Now, the reason that I'm happy and my favorite reason, there's a couple of reasons, but my favorite reason that I'm happy or favorite reason that this game is going to be on ESPN is the fact that it's easier to cover. I know it's selfish. I know that it's selfish, but I don't care because at the end of the day, it's, I mean, I got a show to do. I got a show to do. And I enjoy the fact that you're not, we're not worried about only looking at the box score. See, the stats tell you a certain story, but understanding how those stats came to be paints the picture. And it's kind of like, all right, you can get the Sparks notes with the, with the stats and everything, but here's a perfect example. Some things you will miss, the context you'll miss. There's a perfect example here. Let's say you have an 80-yard touchdown pass. That ball could travel any amount of distance in the air. And if you didn't see it happen, all you see is an 80-yard touchdown pass. Now, tell me that a 80 or 75-yard in the air, right, it's in the air 75 yards, isn't different from a ball that's in the air for 10 yards, and he ran for 70 of it. You know, or a, a ball that's in the air for 50 yards more, more reasonably, right? Those things get the same results, but they have a different process. I can come in here and I can tell you about uh, a Malachi Wideman and what he did as far as, man, he made this guy miss and that guy miss. I don't even know how he got to there if I'm not able to see it. So is it selfish? Yeah, a little bit, just a little bit. Plus, I just want to watch it. I want to watch some football. All right. But I'm OK with that. I'm OK if that. If this is my selfish moment on Locked on HBCU, if this is the one that you're saying, yeah, that was real selfish mouth of the self, then I'm OK with that. But here's a reason that you could also be excited. I'm excited as well. But I think that this could be a potential step forward for all HBCUs. Now, here are the two ways that you could take this information. One is you could sit there and say, man, that's Deion Sanders. That's why they're getting this opportunity. ESPN needs to invest in other schools as well, important on the as well, to show that you're really invested in the brand of HBCU football, not just one guy. I think that that's a well Put together an articulated and valid point. I might have put the articulated way in just to pat myself on the back, but whatever, you know. But I think that you have a point. You have a point. But I'm going to choose to be a little bit more optimistic. First off, before I get into the way I think, I think that if you're a proponent for HBCUs growing, you should never use the they got Deion Sanders line unless you're literally just 
listing the coaching staff because in my mind, when you use, well, they got Deion Sanders. That's the way that I'm trying to see how I want to say it the right way. Okay. When you use the, they got Deion Sanders line, I think a, it minimizes what they're doing because who cares if that's how they got this talent, who cares if that's how they got this attention. Let's get that attention. It's, it's too much focused on the why, not the what. And that kind of is the difference between the, the one way you could take it that I just said I wouldn't in the way that I'm going to say it in a minute. But also, I think it kind of says, well, they got Deion Sanders. It kind of slows the progress, in my opinion, as far as why Alabama A&M can't do this. Why Norfolk State can't do this. Why can't they proceed? Why can't South Carolina State do this? You know, I kind of feel like it makes it seem like you need a star coach to get this talent level sometimes. That's just how I personally feel. And I think that's that's why I don't, don't try to use that it's Deion Sanders thing. But the reason I am taking it a different way is every progress or every movement needs a first step. You need something that's going to start momentum, something that's going to get you moving. And I think that that could be this. Why can't it be, right? Now, if in a couple of years you're sitting there and it's still just Jackson State, and I mean like one or two, if it's still just Jackson State, then we need to call out ESPN on not investing in a brand for real and only investing in a person. But right now, with this just happening, I think that Deion Sanders being the head coach provides a perfect platform for big media companies and whatever that we want to be on. Like we want to have deals with ESPN. We want the exposure. The reason that we are excited about these things, and that's not the only place to get this done. However, it is a place that is national and gives a lot more eyes to the brand. They feel safe with Dion because they know Dion Sanders. They're they're familiar with Coach Sanders. And if that's going to be the reason that HBCU football comes on, then I'm okay with that as long as it continues to spread. See, Jackson State this year. Maybe Jackson State and a Delaware State next year. Maybe even you get to where you have Bowie State out there. You get D2 schools showing off their, their uh, spring game on ESPN. That's what I'm looking for. And if this is going to be a step forward to it, then I'm going to take it. I think that I'm not telling you to thank Jackson State. I'm not telling you to kiss their butt. I'm not telling you to do any of those things because I wouldn't do it. And I don't think you should either. But I think if you step back and look at what it can be, not what it is right now, but what it can be. We don't have to fight about who's the biggest brand and things like that. All of that aside, Jackson State does have the opportunity. This opportunity could turn into opportunities for more people. I understand that Deion Sanders is the coach and he is a familiar face. He is a star NFL player, one of the greatest to ever do it. And that counts for something as far as marketability. I don't I want to get it to the point where you don't need a star head coach for people to care about your HBCU. That's my hope. That's what I think that we can reach and exposure at these type of networks, I think, does contribute to making that become a reality to where all the kids and everybody who is looking as a recruit says, I can go to an HBCU. It's, it's, it's a, it's a great thing to me. It's something that can begin the progress and something, something that can begin the progress to a goal that we all want to reach. And that's why I'm looking at it in a more optimistic tone, more optimistic eyes lens. So I'm going to take it that way. I suggest you do as well. And we're going to watch a game on Saturday and we're going to be happy by it. We're going to have a good time. And something that I'm happy about, including the coverage, is the fact that we are going with our top 10 draft eligible HBCU player list. My guy, Gerald, Coach G, he is back and he's talking about Joshua Williams, defensive back out of Fayetteville State. We're going to talk about just how somebody from Fayetteville State, a, Duke, a D2 school, can rise up the draft charts with the speed that he did. But first, I want to tell you about Athletic Greens because I have made Athletic Greens a daily part of my routine. I first got it because, listen, I wanted to have my gut health taken care of. I wanted to make sure that I was treating my body like the temple that it is. And the reason I stuck with it and ingrained itself in my daily routine so quickly is the fact that it tastes good. See, the benefits health-wise is the fact that it's 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food, source superfoods, and probiotics. Those things are great. I love it but I take it right before my day starts. Whether it's right before breakfast or right after breakfast, I do it so that my body feels like a well-oiled machine throughout the duration of the day. I appreciate them for making them, a, making them cheaper than a lot of places, tasting good. And then also you have 7,000 plus five-star reviews. I'm not the only person vouching. 
for, for this, okay? Now, if you go to athleticsgreen.com slash college, you can get a free one-year supply of immune support and vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. So I'm giving you a free supply and travel packs for free. Come on, man. And I'm taking care, helping you take care of your body. It's an easy choice. Go to athleticsgreen.com slash college. Take care of yourself. All right, so keep on rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day. Every day, I do appreciate that. And make sure that you're checking out the Locked on NFL Draft show. It's going to be April 8, uh, 28th, 29th, and 30th. Every single day, rounds one through seven, Locked on has you taken care of, covering all of that. And before the day comes, go check out the Locked on NFL Draft, the NFL Mock Draft, and see what our local experts think that your team is going to pick. You can catch that on the podcast feed for the Locked On NFL Draft podcast, and you can catch the actual draft coverage on Locked On NFL's YouTube page. Now, Coach G is going to come on and tell you about how Joshua Williams can rise from a cornerback at Fayetteville State to being a guy that has really seized his moment in the pre-draft process, including the senior bowl. All right, Gerald, we're nearing the end. We're at number two, and we have Joshua Williams. And simple question, how does a kid from Fayetteville State shoot up the draft charts like he did? Well, for one, it helps to be in a pretty good conference playing against a pretty good team. So, you know, I'm a CIAA guy, so I'm naturally going to say CIAA is one of the, you know, better football conferences, you don't mind me saying. Um, and when you play against teams like uh, Bowie State on a consistent basis, definitely in the championship games. And, you know, it helps when you're a six foot three, 220, uh, 220, 200 pound corner that usually helps you draft up regardless of where you're at. And then once you – all it takes is one person to see it. One person to see it, throw it out there, and everybody's like, hmm, okay, this is a 6-3 corn. I mean, it's, it's D2, but you can see the intangibles. Oh, okay, let's give it a shot. So, hey, um, <laughs> that just shows how good of a player he is, man. To be, to come, to be one of the highly touted guys and be invited to such a – a highly ranked bowl game after your season from a Division II school or HBCU. That's amazing. It's really amazing. It's something that we shouldn't overlook. Yeah, it's something we shouldn't overlook at all. And you say it only takes one person. It only takes one person to see it. And a lot of times, one person sees it, vocalizes it, and then everybody else begins to look, and they see it as well. That yeah. one person, for me at least, was Jim Nagy, the head of the Senior Bowl, and – he says he thinks Williams is going to be the first HBCU player off the board. He invited Williams to the Senior Bowl, the only Division II player there of any school, not just HBCUs, and one of two HBCU players there. So obviously, he holds him in high regard. And for me, that was a moment that was big. You're getting to play against top competition level, which is a, a knock against Division II prospects, of course. And he seized the moment. How was he able to do that? Because he showcased why, no, let me put not why. He showcased what teams want moving forward with these corners. End of the day, the, the average height of an NFL corner, I, it may be six foot even, maybe. And, you know, when you start to look at these receivers, we've seen the receivers that's coming out nowadays. They're all, like, we, I think I might have said this like three times since we've been on the podcast. They like these big guys that are fast. <laughs> so when you have a lot of shorter corners, who are probably equally as fast. However, when it comes to jump balls, when it comes to fighting for the fighting for a ball, it seems as if these big receivers seem to have an advantage. And then when you put them in the slide, you put them all these different positions, and they're able to move left, right, up. There, it's becoming impossible sometimes for these, you know, normal sized human beings, six foot tall, hundred ninety pounds. That's not a all small human guy. beings. If, tall human beings. If we're being honest, like, <laughs> yeah, six foot is a good size. That's a pretty big human. Six foot two hundred <laughs> is normal. That's, I think Jalen Ramsey is about six one and a half, about two hundred pounds. You know, uh, Alexander from uh, the pack. He's around like five eleven, six foot, about buck ninety. That was a nice, normal walking down the street, nice size human being. But when you're lined up against <laughs> Julio, Mike Evans, you look at DK Metcalf, who's an outside linebacker playing, <laughs> playing receiver, and you want to. A five foot eight, hundred seventy five pound guy guarding him every time. It's hard. So you have a guy like Josh Williams, who's six foot three, high level, two hundred pounds. You know, slender frame, but 
he's not weak. You see him when he goes in his press when he goes to press. When it, and we've seen him on the senior bowl tape during practice. He was pressing guys. The release were just it was hard to get a good release on. And if you beat him on a release, what they love the most out of these guys are the tall and lanky. They see the knock on them is not they don't have that quick twitch. He has it. He clocked some of the fastest times during practice at the senior bowl as well on game speed. Game speed alone, he was one of the fastest guys at the senior bowl. So Yeah. Yeah, and let, let's talk about that because he didn't run the time that he wanted to at the at you know during the 40 yard dash at the combine. But he clocked in some of the fastest game speed at these practices. Do you think that coaches and, and scouts will trust the fact that the game speed is the game speed and the 40 yard dash was either a bad run or just wasn't his event for the day? I think they should. Because the tape shows people aren't just running past this young man. They're not. They're not losing him on these inside routes and these outside routes. He's right there. He's in the hip pocket. As a coach looks like to say, he's going to phase. So it's like you can't you can't just utilize the 40. Because even Darius Blinnard, who's one of the fastest linebackers on the field in the NFL, and I'm pretty sure most guys will tell you, I think that most guys would probably say he's the number one linebacker in the NFL. I don't I think he may have ran a four, eight, four, seven in that range, you know, something as they would say is slow. But okay, put him on the field. <laughs> he's not out. Nobody's just outrunning him. He's guarding some of the best tight ends. And well, he's usually guarding the best tight end. And he's guarding these running backs out of the backfield. He seems to be pretty fast to me. So the game speed is most important. Well, you know, I'm a D line guy. So, you know, only thing I care about is how fast are you in 10 yards? Yeah. And it's not even that. How fast are you in three to five yards? Can you beat the offensive tackle to the spot? That's all I care about. So 40s are cool, they're beautiful. Lovely. Looks good. Shows you're explosive. But that game speed, even when he was going through the drills, he was like, dang, this guy's 6'3? So that's you have to look at that. Teams are like, okay, I can work with that. Even if I catch him, you know, they don't some people might try and, you know, catch see if they could catch him in the fourth, fifth round, but he may not be there just off of what the needs are in the NFL. We spoke about this before. You need people that can block these edge rushers who are pretty much oversized safeties now. And you need someone that can cover these receivers who are, oh, well, we want to call them undersized DNs. I don't even know what you want to call them. Like, this is athletic DNs. So the need for Josh Williams is high. So that's why he's so high on his list. There's a big difference between 40 times and actual game speed. That is what really matters, the game speed. So make sure you're checking that out with all of the prospects that you're being an at-home scout for, not just Joshua Williams. Now we're going to continue talking about his rise and some of the things that he does really well as far as projecting towards the next level. But first, I want to tell you about BetOnline.net because BetOnline has you covered through the whole NBA playoffs, right? We've seen a couple of series go to 2 nothing, but I'll tell you one series that we didn't. I'll tell you one series we didn't see go to 2 nothing, and that was the New Orleans Pelicans versus the Phoenix Suns. And they're going home. It's going to the Smoothie King Center. And I told you, I told you that you need to put some money down. Now, I don't tell you to, to bet often, but when I do, I have 100% batting average or 1,000% batting average, all right? I told you about the Pelicans versus San Antonio Clippers, and then I told you about the, the second game. I didn't tell you about game one. I told you about the second game. So maybe I'm a little marked, but I'll tell you, if you are going to take my advice, make sure that you go into betonline.net. And if the NBA playoffs isn't your thing, they have everything as well as favorite Vegas casino games. Just make sure you're going there because they are the fastest and easiest way to wage on all of your favorite sports. Bet online where the game starts. All right, so we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU. We're going to talk about how does Joshua Williams project at the next level as what is his best fit and what HBCU prospect actually is the best comparison for what he could be in the NFL as well. There have been some conversations about, I'm not going to say conversations, there have been little comments that I've heard, not many, but a few, talking about Josh Williams as a safety. I know he's a corner. I just want to know what's your thought on him possibly being a safety at the next level. Is that something that intrigues you or, no, nah, let's keep him outside? I'd love to see it. I mean, in the uh, the Shrine Bowl, they gave um, Bell an opportunity to play uh, both. So I'm like, hmm, 
I mean, Bell could do it. I think, you know, him, Bell and, and Williams, they're pretty, you know, versatile guys. You know, I feel like if Bell could do it, then Williams could do it. And I can see why people would say, oh, why not see Williams at safety? He's 6'3", 200 pounds, and show he has ball skills. So, I mean, if you have a guy that you can – think of like uh, Earl Thomas, to me, was one of the first guys that legit were like a, could play corner and safety. So, for me, this is me watching. So, for me, when I look at Josh Williams, if you have a guy who's 6'3", 200, who clearly shows that he could play outside corner, it wouldn't hurt to have him as a safety because now you have a 6'3 guy that could go up against these tight ends who are just – Call it spade to spade. They're just too big, too fast for these linebackers nowadays. And they're too big, too fast for some of these undersized safeties we have nowadays. So if you got a guy like 6'3", 200, if you have a certain package where you like a big nickel package or, I don't know, maybe you do a race car package where you have, you know, smaller people on the field you want to have your biggest corner as your safety or a rover, you can do that too. But that's where versatility comes into play. Coach Nook says that, you know, Josh Williams may be one of the most versatile guys in the draft and definitely probably number one versatile guy outside of James Houston on the defensive side of the ball when it comes to HBCU sports. So let's get back to his, his focus. Let's get back into him being a cornerback because, like I said, for the most part, I hear him as a cornerback in the next level. So what kind of corner is he? He's long. Is he a press guy? Is he a, a zone guy? Is he a, a man off? What What is his skill set or – what would be his best fit as far as this is the system that we want Joshua Williams to go to? I fully believe that he could play and be successful in any system. Um, Coach Nooks, who's our defensive back guy, um, he says that he's very comfortable in zone or press, you know, zone or press man or man. So I think he's just one of those all-around corners where you can put him in any type of system. But I think he would thrive in a system that's pretty much like man man at least a good over 50 percent 60 percent of the time like you could throw him i mean hey throw him on the rams why not i mean they play a system but they do they do a little bit of mixture of everything and then you have like the team that like the steelers you know they've been a zone blitzing organization i feel like you have to run the zone blitz if you're at defensive coordinator for the steelers so you throw him in there he can work with that too because he's shown that hey even when you have to press it in some of these man, uh, zone schemes where you have to press it and make it look like man and you drop back as a zone he does a really good job of pressing his pressing his uh you know receiver, and then he's also good at working his eyes back in back out. So I'm just basing off what Coach Coach Nook says, and I trust everything he says when it comes to quarterback play and defensive back play. Yeah, this guy is the goods. <laughs> I mean, this guy he could play anything, and I think he could thrive in any system. And he actually may even get bigger, so that may help him stronger. That may help with his press even then. So I think the press is probably his number one attribute, and his ball skills are pretty good. And he just does a good job of not losing his receiver. He doesn't get caught looking in the back so often as well. Yeah, and I'm sure that his long arms help with the press and make sure you keep a feel on the wide receiver. But I'm going to ask you a question as far as one singular player. If you had to compare Joshua Williams to one player that's in the NFL right now, who would it be? Ooh, the NFL right now. Yeah, man, I want the people to be able to say, okay, I haven't seen much Joshua Williams, but I've seen this guy. I got I've seen this better. guy. I can kind of understand what Joshua Williams could become. I have something better for you. Talk to I you. have a guy that you know very well. Um, okay. He had a couple family members in the NFL. He's an HBCU guy that we compared him to at a draft HBCU. We all came together, and Coach Nooks was pretty much like the head of it. and. He said that uh, his pro comp is a uh, DRC. That's what I thought. That's what you was going to say. Dominic Rogers Camardi. The length, the speed, the athleticism. I mean, <laughs> I saw something on Josh Williams the other day. I was like, like he, he, he kissed the rim. I saw it like a. No, nah, it was crazy. He done he kissed the rim and it was so effortless. He was just like, oh, okay, let me just jump up in the air real quick. It was just so fluid. And so when you look at DRC, it's like, yo, it's just that raw athleticism that was just had him near the ball, around the ball. And once he got his hands on the ball, good luck catching him. Yeah. I think DRC might have been the best pro con. I, when, Coach, when Coach Nooks brought it up, I was like, one, I see it. Two, that looks good because we got another HBCU guy with confident HBCU guy. And 
Yeah. Kamardi, you know, for for you know the the casual fan, I mean, he was you know considered a top corner at some point in his yeah. career, and yeah. you know, so I mean, that is not a bad ceiling for Joshua Williams, considering he came from Fayetteville State. I like it. I like it. If he can become Dominique Rogers Cromartie, oh yeah, we got us a successful guy, and he'll be a, a long-standing member in the NFL. So I'm excited to see that. And listen, we got one more week, and then we're done with this list. I'm excited. We already know who's going to be number one. I mean, just process of elimination. But I'm excited to hear about why this guy, Marquise Bell, is going to be our top player. That'll be next week, next Thursday, on the first day of the NFL Draft. G, I appreciate you coming on with me. Anytime, brother. See you next week. For sure. Man, I love coming on here and talking with Coach G because – he always leaves me with something that I feel like, oh, I learned that one. Or, oh, I ain't think of that one. I love when we have those conversations. That Joshua Williams to DRC comparison to HBCU guys, I loved it. It was great. And he will be back next Thursday on day one of the draft as we break down our number one player on the list, Marquise Bell. So make sure that you're making Locked on HBCU your first listen of the day every day and tomorrow's Feature Friday so you know that's going to be something that you do not want to miss. For your second listen of the day, check out Locked on NFL Draft with Eric Crocker, former NFL and AFL cornerback, and then also Ryan Tracy giving you all the insight that you could possibly need and want, including the things that you don't even know that you need. They're going to give you all of that in preparation for this year's draft. It's a big-time event, man. You're not going to want to miss it. And in the meantime, in between time, you can find me on that blue app, that bird, yes, Twitter, at South Exclusives. Until next time that we hear each other family, take care, stay blessed. Peace.